Time having arrived, we call this meeting of the Brockton School Committee to order. I ask you to please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance. Sunday, uh, we lost an outstanding young man, a great member of the community, and a fourth member of our Brockton Public Schools uh, family, uh, Carl Evan Yancey, when his life was ended much too soon. So I would just like to ask everyone for a moment of silence in memory of Carl. Thank you. This evening, uh, we generally open the school committee meetings with the hearing of visitors, which is an opportunity for anyone to come in front of the school committee and the mayor and the superintendent to make a statement about the few minutes. Uh, however, no one signed in tonight to appear, so we'll move on with business. <clears throat> First up is our consent agenda. This is the manner in which the school committee is able to handle routine business in a block to uh, expedite moving the meeting along. However, at each meeting, any member of the school committee may request to have any individual item on the consent agenda removed for individual consideration. So at this time, I'll ask if any members of the committee would like to remove any items from the consent agenda. Mrs. Joyce. Item C. Okay, item C. Any others? Well, seeing no others, I'll ask uh, for a motion on the consent agenda minus item C. So moved. Motion's been made, seconded by Ms. Clark. Okay. All in favor? Opposed? That carries unanimously. Mrs. Joyce, item C. Uh, just a quick question with regard to the home education program requests. For this uh, school year, is there someone that is kind of... Dr. Tarasi, could you join us, please? <laughs> I know in, in years past, but this seems to be a larger list than we have seen in years past. Are you seeing a trend Actually, towards we, more we, homeschooling? We've seen a trend away from homeschooling. Um, last year, the, last year we had nine, 93 students on home education. The home education program, and this year the count is 86. So we're at, we actually have fewer students this year than we had last year. Okay. Um, those um, those 86 students actually represent l fewer households. Right. In other words, we have 51 households, mm -hmm. and the breakdown is we have uh, in the K to five span there are 38 students. At the middle school level there are 25 students. At the high school level, 23 students. Um, and that's um, basically at the elementary and middle school. Um, at the elementary, it's the same. We have fewer at the middle school and fewer at the high school. And so, so the trend is away. Actually, receive a Brockton High diploma, correct? N no. No. H home education students um, are not eligible for Brockton High diploma, nor are they eligible to take MCAS. So they. Oftentimes, the home education families will affiliate. You know, we need to be made aware of who's on home education, but we um, we don't award the diploma, nor do we allow them. They, they they're not allowed to take MCAS, and they oftentimes affiliate with some sort of national organization which will award the diploma. The distinction that we want to make is between home education, which is what's up before the committee mm -hmm. this evening, right. and home teaching, which is when, for example, a special ed student or a, or a student with some sort of a disability um, requires services at home, but they are our student. Right, right. I understand that. So what do they generally graduate with? Often, oftentimes they graduate with uh, a diploma that is sort of some sort of national certification, that, but not a state, not a state of Massachusetts diploma, mm -hmm. um, that is offered by an organization. 
many times what happens is um, they, they undergo home education during their early school years, and then by middle school or high school, we find them back with us. Yeah, but there is a number of students here that are, that are high school. That That's grade, right. High and, school grade, whatever. Right, you want and, to call and, it. and the majority of those will have affiliated with a, uh, okay. s some national organization which monitors, oftentimes by virtual education, mm -hmm. uh, which monitors their, um, their educational progress. But where we have to approve this, are they required to submit lesson plans and a curriculum? The, so do we provide it to them? We, we are required to, um, at, we're required to ask them to submit their curriculum. They're not necessarily required to comply. Um, but but most of them do, and they submit a curriculum to us. Um, but we, we don't have much discretion in terms of um, refusing it, only if we feel there is um, neglect or abuse, um, which most often is not the case. Um, can, then we can, of course, intervene under you know Statute 51A. But beyond that, we don't get to judge the quality of their education. By law, we, we don't get to judge it. And the state and federal governments don't intervene with that at all? They don't. Okay. What's the, the most popular reason that parents choose to homeschool their children? Um, the, the, sometimes for um, religious reasons mm -hmm. and other times for uh, social reasons. That they, they just they feel like they they want their children to be affiliated with their own community and not necessarily uh, experience everything that one experiences in a, in, pu in a public domain, and that's uh, a family choice. It, we're not allowed to evaluate that. Okay, are children that are homeschooled in Brockton eligible for extracurricular activities? They're eligible at the discretion of the principal. In other words, we are not mandated to provide them. But, you know, for example, should, uh, and, and oftentimes this has been the case, where a family will come to us and say, you know, I'd like my child to participate in some sort of after-school activity or maybe a club at the school or something like that for so reasons of socialization. Um, we'll ask the principal if, uh, if they would be comfortable with that. Um, Almost always a principal has said yes, we'll, we'll allow that. Um, so that, that ha has happened mm -hmm. uh, over the past, since I've been here. Okay, and what happens if we don't accept this, these requests? You Do mean we as, really, uh, ha as a school committee, have authority over these yeah, requests? Yeah, well, th or are we just accepting th th this, the this is more just keeping you informed mm -hmm. than literally asking for permission. Okay. So we're basically accepting the information accepting right. the report okay yeah in other words it's a it, we want to keep you informed as to what's going on okay. uh, at all levels it, which is what is much appreciated right, right. Okay. they need to continue to show performance they need to show that the children are progressing academically um, they, they they turn in yearly reports but um, there, there there aren't a lot of legal sanctions that the local district can bring to bear. As long as, as, long as the parents are pleased with the performance, their, the, the academic performance of their children, and there is no neglect or abuse that we can detect, we don't get to say, you're not doing as well as you should, have, should be doing or could be doing. My question would be, and I'm not sure if you have these numbers, do we have families that begin to educate their children at home and then choose at different levels to send them to yes. the middle school? Yes. I, I don't have school. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but in fact that does happen a lot yeah. where especially in the early years, you know, sometimes parents are a little bit reluctant to commit to the school department. And then after a few years they realize that there are a lot of advantages to being in a school setting, socialization, not even to mention the academic, mm -hmm. and then they, they, they choose to affiliate with us. So that, that happens a lot. But there is no common core assessment? They're not required to yet. follow the common core. Yeah. No. And, and, you know, oftentimes, you know, sometimes you get people for quasi-political reasons. They don't, want, they don't want to participate in the mandated curriculum of the state. So there's sort of sometimes an anti-authoritarian <coughs> flavor. Right. I understand that. Just for informational purposes, I'd be interested to see maybe like a three-ish snapshot historically of children that have been homeschooled and then enter our school system, 
where they are academically as related to their peers in the same grade levels? Are they at grade level? Or are they above? Are they below for we, the most part? We have, uh, we, we don't really keep that, you we don't, don't really okay. keep data at that yeah. granular level. Well, you must, um, when they enter our school system, there must be some assessments to know where to place them. Typically done at the school level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, mostly done at the school level. To see. Not that we really have any authority over any anyway. Right. So it might be you know an exercise in futility. So, um, but in any case, I was just interested in okay. it a little bit. Okay, thank you, Sal. Welcome. Well, anyone else on this matter, Mr. Minicello. Um, <laughs> hi, Sal. Uh, how often are these lists updated? The, well, we, we, we bring the list before the school committee every year. Right. But, um, in, but in terms of checking, I know there's one name on this list that they haven't been in the city for over a year and a half. And then there's another name that doesn't have any address whatsoever. So I'm just curious. If you give me the name, I'll look into it. But we do it on a yearly basis. OK. All right. I'll give it to you afterwards. All right. Uh, all right. Dr. Okay. Tracy, do they at some out. point fill, they fill out paperwork to let us they, know they, they have fill a out, <clears throat> There's an application process which basically they're informing us that they're doing uh, homeschooling. Right. Okay. Yeah. Y'all set, Mr. Minichella? Anyone else? Okay, we'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to accept the report. Okay, second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. All in favor? Motion passes. Okay. So we will move on to the report of the superintendent of schools. Thank you, Mayor. Um, tonight, um, I also, the mayor has mentioned the passing uh, of Carl Gancy, who was a monitor teacher assistant at our guarded school. We certainly express our sympathy uh, to the family. I do have to share with you just quickly a couple of stories. Uh, first of all, the day of the service. I want to thank uh, Dr. Tarasi, our pupil personnel, our special education office, our therapeutic team that stepped in. 22 members were allowed from the Goddard School because Cal was such a presence, not only as part of the staff, but with the families and the students to allow them to attend the services. So I want to thank Vinnie Searcy and the therapeutic support team you know, for, for certainly allowing that to happen. And I do have to tell you the strength of Cal's mother. Mm. The day, actually Monday morning, and this happened on Sunday evening, uh, Daryl and I believe uh, Lauren uh, appeared at the Goddard School because they wanted to talk to Jay Lander and the staff that was having such a difficult morning dealing with this senseless loss to talk about, they wanted to meet the people that he talked about each and every day, the kids, the staff, they knew names, and you know her, her presence was just so important for them to be able to carry on. So I, uh, again, we will continue to, to support her and, and I thank her and her family for having that strength. Um, on, on a different note, um, I think you can all see that we are welcoming back Jessica Freeborn, who is now a junior at Brockton High School. She's joining us as the representative this year. So she liked us. She wanted to come back and, and continue to be part of the team. So, so Jess, can you update us, and I hope you update us about the big things happening at Brockton High this week. Of course. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll start with last Friday night. Um, the Boxer Buddies cheered with our um, cheerleaders at the home games. That was awesome. They really enjoyed themselves, so thank you to the cheerleaders for making that happen. Um, the highlights from the football game Friday night were also shown at the Patriots game on Sunday, so coming to school on Monday, that was really cool to find out that our game was shown. Um, all right, moving on. Tomorrow will be the third and final day of the accreditation process. This process started last Sunday with interviews of teachers, school committee members, parents, and students. So I've had a few in my classes, and it was really very interesting to hear what they had to say about feedback to, um, to our teachers and get to talk to them about all the great things happening at Brockton High. Um, okay. Progress notices will be distributed in homeroom on Friday. Yay, I'm excited. Um, PSATs are next Wednesday. So, yay, PSATs. Um, good luck to everyone who will be taking them. Um, and the year is definitely flying by for parent teacher conferences are Thursday, next Thursday, from 6 to 8. So, don't forget to go. We thrilled you shared that. With oh, I bet they will. 
Jessica, thank you so much. And we do have uh, the accreditation, which we've certainly talked about here at the school committee meeting, <coughs> happening um, at Brockton High School. The kickoff was on Sunday. And I will share with you, we we're in this very room, and for the first hour, it's a presentation all about Brockton High that included a little bit of history, um, certainly information about our curriculum, our students took part, actually performed uh, from the play that they had done, Guys and, uh, Guys and Dolls, in the spring. Um, they did a, and I am talking the whole team from Principal Wolder to all her staff, to all her students, the kickoff was wonderful, excellent. Um, they had a reception after the school committee had opportunities to meet with the visiting committee to talk about their role in supporting Brockton High School. Um, the reception uh, again happened here. Uh, we also have met with the visiting um, committees a number of times. They have shadowed students in the hallways. I've checked in each day with Principal Wolder. Uh, it will wrap up tomorrow at um, about 2.15 p.m. where all of the staff will come into the auditorium. There'll be a debriefing to talk about the strengths, to talk about the challenges, to talk about the accreditation. There'll be a final report at a later date. We'll continue to keep you updated. Um, and again, we will be pleased to, to move on with uh, so many of the other things that we have at hand. So that's an update on our accreditation. Um, I'd also like to uh, talk to you. We know that the October 1st date has come and gone. It was a date that we were anticipating having growth of over 400 for the past couple of years. And while we welcome growth, you know, we all know what is happening with our facilities. We continue to closely monitor as we bring a facility committee to look at some short-term needs and also to start to plan for a 20-year plan for the district. So I'd like to invite, and this is truly just a snapshot you will have a much longer presentation. I'd like to invite uh, Soraya DeBarros, our director of the Parent Information Center, to come down. And I wanted her to talk to you about some of the concerns this summer with dealing with you know, some of the budget cuts that we had made. And this impacted some of our staffing. A lot of hard work went on. And, and the numbers are uh, phenomenal as far as the people that actually come through the Parent Information Center. Um, I guess I have to say we actually had a modest increase when we talk about over 400 for two years, and I know you got this in your packet, the uh, increase uh, this year was 129 students. So we, you know, we can say that we've slowed down, but we still have had over 100 student increase this year. So Soraya, would you share with us? Thank you, and thank you Superintendent Smith for having me here tonight. Um, yes, we did have a, a tough summer. This morning I said that we had a brutal summer, and that's the only adjective I can use to describe what we went through. We made it though, we made it through, and uh, everything ended up working out, but uh, like, the, uh, like the superintendent said a few, minutes, a few seconds ago, um, due to budget cuts, we saw some positions eliminated. We had some permanent positions that were eliminated, and we also lost six summer positions that we used to have in the previous years that because of the budget cut, we could not have them this year. So we had to do more with less, having less resources and, and also less human capital in our office. Uh, we also reduced the hours of operation. Um, we usually were open to parents all week, Monday through Friday from 8.30 to 2.30, and then on Wednesday nights from 4 to 7. During the summer, again, because of the budget cuts, we had to um, reduce our hours, and we were open Monday through Thursday from 8.30 to 12.30. Um, that posed a lot of problems for parents, the, the working parents that could not make it there. Uh, luckily, we were open the last two weeks prior to the beginning of schools. We were open uh, at night as well, in the evening, for parents to come in. We did have a high volume of parents this year. Um, I don't know if you've heard it, but we had lines out the door. We had lines going on the sidewalk. And the place, our center, was very full to the point where we didn't have seats for students or for parents or families to sit. It was extremely busy. Um, but like I said, we, we made it through, and um, in our office we have, um, we have two parts of the office. We have the processing part and we have the intake part. And the intake part, we only have five paraprofessionals, five clerical paras, who did the work. And then in the back we had the processing people who were also processing all the um, registrations and transfers, and I'll go through the numbers with you. 
Um, but before I, I talk about the numbers, I just have to thank the central staff for the amazing job that they did. They came down, people came down on their own during their lunch breaks, after work, at night, working for free just to help us out. So we, have administrative, we had administrative assistance from different departments, from the bilingual office, from the special ed department, from um, instructional technology coming to help us. And we're very thankful for each one of them. That showed us love. It showed us that they do care about the work that we do, and they do care about the families. It, it, and I have to say that um, my staff, the staff of the school registration office, worked end endlessly endless hours working at nights and during the weekends to make sure that on the first day of school everyone was in. We had a very good first day of school. We had an amazing first day of kindergarten. Everyone was in school. Everyone was assigned. Parents were happy. The schools were happy. I contacted the principals. Everyone had a great time on the first day of kindergarten as well. So uh, mission accomplished when it came to that. Um, I passed this out. You have this um, beautiful numbers, right? And you can see, and this is just during the summer months. And you can see that in kindergarten, we assigned a total of 1,466 students. We had a few students that there were no shows, okay? But we still have, as of today, we only have 13 incomplete files. And incomplete files can be that they still need to provide us with the proofs of residency, but in the majority of times, it has to do with immunizations. They have not provided us with the health records, and as you know, they cannot start school without the health records. Um, for grades one through eight, I have it in two sections. Transfers, we did a total of 841 transfers. And for registrations, we have a total of 659 registrations. Those are new students. Um, we also have sheltered English immersion students, special ed students, and 96 returning students in grades one through eight. Um, for grades nine to 12, we saw a huge influx of students um, in grades nine through 12. 145 of them are new students, 122 of them are SEI. The, ma the majority is Cape Verdean SEI, ninth fed and, nine, and 92 returning students, okay? So a total of registrations and transfers of 3,347 students. And um, I did a little bit of math, and Dr. Cancel, you're gonna be happy with me. On the second page, um, I broke it down a little bit just to show you how many registrations we did and how many registrations each caseworker did during the summer. And the numbers speak by themselves, but I would like to highlight a few things. So out of the total just registrations, not transfers, registrations we had 2,506 with only five caseworkers that we had, that's 500 registrations per caseworker. When you divide that by 40 days that we were open during the summer, for four days a week, for 10 weeks, we have a total of 12 registrations a day, and it usually takes 25 to 35 minutes for people to register. So when we do the math, we have 12 registrations divided by four hours of work when we were open. So um, we had a total of three registrations per hour. And when you see that it takes 25 to 35 minutes to do one registration, that means that we did, we did three registrations in one hour, and so doing that, we reduced the time of doing registration so that we, can see, we could see as many parents as possible, and parents didn't have to sit there and wait. With that said, I have to say that the staff of Serpic worked extremely hard nonstop from the time we were open. And we can say, okay, you were only open for four hours. Yes, we were. But if we had parents in line waiting, we didn't close the doors. They still came in. So at two and at three o'clock, we were still registering. That gave us time also to work and process the registrations afterwards. Uh, which also gave us time to look through the discipline records from each student 
to contact the previous schools where they were coming from, to contact Mr. Mike Thomas, Ms. Liz Berry, and also Dr. Tarasi, and to get the approval on some placements. Um, so it gave, gave us a way of, and more time actually, to sit down and look at each folder individually before we placed each, each child in the program that they were supposed to go to. Okay, so that's just a little bit of math, just for you to see how hard everyone worked. Okay. Uh, again, sorry. Um, you know, I want to thank you. It was uh, a long summer, a hot summer. Um, Soraya has told you certainly that you know just before Labor Day weekend, I think I shared with you um, there were a team of. Um, workers down there get, making sure the kids had bus routes, making sure we were troubleshooting, again, so that every child was able to start school on time. And again, we thank your staff, and as you mentioned, um, you know, people from Central came down and, and really assisted you, and, and that's what went on all summer. I hope to do uh, a report a little more at length about some of the registrations at another time, probably later in November, but I wanted you with the October 1st report, you know, going in, to have an opportunity to ask questions or just see what the registration cycle was like this past year. We would also like to thank Lieutenant Mills and, and his staff because of the police presence that we had there, which helped us greatly, and also the attendance officers because they were the ones who went out there doing 139 visits, home visits, so that we could have students in school because a lot of the parents could not provide us with the proofs of residency that we asked for them to, require, to, to, um, to give us. They, um, they could not provide us with that, so the attendance officers went to the house. So we would like to thank them as well. Okay. Questions? Any questions for Mr. Bowers? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. For it is um, we did uh, receive our 2014 MCAS results in the district. Um, I know we see this as a district that is showing continuous improvement. Um, I again will be prepared to report to you uh, sometime I think in late November a full report from Dr. Cancel about each and every one of the schools. We'll talk to you about the strengths in our schools. We'll talk to you about our superintendent priority or focus schools. We'll talk to you if we're going to be having additional schools join that. But I do want to have Dr. Cancel come up and talk to you. Uh, again, a brief snapshot. But I do want to say that I want to highlight that although we are a level three district, and we're proud of that, we have shown amazing improvement with a number of our schools that uh, remain at level two or have joined level two. You have four of your middle schools, Ashfield, Plouffe, North Middle School, West Middle School, that are level two schools. At your elementary out of 11, you have the Kennedy, you have the Angelo, and you have the Davis. And I will tell you when you see the full report that East Junior High, and when I tell you it was this close because of the improvements that are happening at, excuse me, East Middle School, you can see I've been around a long time. Um, so we, we are very proud of the direction we're going. Again, we have schools that we have concern about. We will continue to support them. Your Office of Teaching and Learning under Deputy Superintendent Barry, uh, her team, um, June Sable working with our K-5 to schools, Dr. Cliff Murray working with our 6-12, to and Sharon Wolder up at the high school. They're a formidable team. Um, the one thing that was was really interesting as we sat down even with the accreditation. You know, we are a new team in many ways, but the hard work that's going on, um, the, the looking at the data and making sure that we're positioned to continue that success um, is something I'm very pleased with. So Dr. Cancel will give us a, a very brief snapshot. We'll have an opportunity to have um, a much longer presentation. I'm sure you're thrilled with that, but that'll be sometime in November. But we do have some good news to share. Yes. Uh, this, you like the snapshot? Yes. Snapshot's good. A quick snapshot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I will talk about healthcare tonight. Just a brief of Dr. Cancel and Same Sex. Yeah, right. <laughs> I wish it were. Uh... Okay, let's see where I am here. Remote will disk E. No, that's not it. Okay, give me a minute here. 
Try this. I wanted to thank everyone for uh, dressing up for tonight. That's my standard joke. Um, if my jokes aren't good, I did hire a new joke writer, Wanda. So uh, that, that was the first one. I don't know how. Yeah. Quick. Yeah, OK. So we started a little slow, but here we go. Uh, this is going to be three minutes or less. The MCAS parents reports are are going out, they will be sent out Wednesday. Um, if people say, why, you know, we heard the small little town next door has already sent theirs out, they don't have the issues we have of trying to figure out where a thousand um, former fifth graders now somewhere sprinkled throughout the middle schools are. So we just, and we also have an accreditation at the high school, so we decided in order to get everyone their reports so they can all go at the same time. It'll be Wednesday. In a very, very, very brief nutshell, if you compare the major measures from this year to last year, you see that ELA is up, math is down, and I promise to say this, um, math last year had a breakout year. It is not surprising after a breakout year to sort of retrench back to a former state. This is above where we had been in 2012, so I'm not that concerned about it. And the other thing is the uh, ESGP, the English Language Arts Student Growth, and the MSGP, the Math Student Growth, are both above 50. And anytime you're at 50 or above 50, you're in very good shape. So if it goes down a point or up a point, I don't worry too much about it. Above 50 is very good. Science is up. so. The long and the short of it is, overall, decent year. There were pockets where it was better and pockets where it was worse. I will go into uh, glorious detail on another night. Here are the level two schools, uh, as uh, the superintendent pointed out. Really impressive that you have four of your six middle schools in level two status, and there was one that was right on the cusp. Very happy to see um, our K through 8s represented as well as elementary. We'd like to see more, but this is where we are now. We have we have one more than last year. This is the big news. I saved it for last. It literally came in. Um, I was in my uh, colleague Jocelyn Meek's office. We were starting our big war room uh, strategy session of how, for the third time, Jocelyn will be the architect of the effort to fend off a charter coming to Brockton, and Kathy comes into the room saying that she has wonderful news, read our email. So we did. I started with a quote. I uh, watched the fantastic uh, students at Brockton High do their Guys and Dolls rendition, so I said I'll quote some Shakespeare. Our remedies oft in ourselves do lie. In other words, if you don't want a charter to come to Brockton, just show the world there's no need. Well, we did it, and lo and behold, what really made us move out, this is a very esoteric thing. I'm gonna be really brief. I'm not gonna go into the weeds. The bottom line is they rank all the schools in a way that they never do for anything else, but they do for this. And lo and behold, because of our student growth, we were out of the uh, bottom 10% of our most comparable districts, the nine that I always compare ourselves to, um, six were in, three were out. So we were in very good company uh, in terms of comparable urbans to be out of that level. And because of that, there's a, there's a little law that a lot of people didn't know about, but it requires the first two charters to go to districts in the bottom 10%. Since we're not in the bottom 10%, we got an email from the deputy commissioner who said uh, there will be no charter in Brockton. So that is the charter school update, the MCAS update, and I'm open to questions. People are stunned. No, brief. Telling you truly, this is hot off the press. I was leaving. I did try to send a note out to all of you and. And I was very pleased, and what I want to say publicly, first of all, when you look at the hard work 
that's going on. I see you know, principals here in the audience tonight. I see Kim Gibson from our teachers union. It is the hard work of your principals, your teachers, the people that are in those schools doing the work each and every day. But again, in, in looking at what happened here, you in Brockton offer so many choices. You know, for, for all that we've read about charter schools, and I know we've been through this for a number of years, it isn't necessarily keeping a charter out. One of the things that you have continued to say to our constituents here in Brockton is everything you could possibly ask for is here for your children. You have a TAG program. You have an international baccalaureate program. You're looking at, you're going to be hearing about the possibility of an arts academy coming in. You have opportunities up at the high school for students with AP, with vocational classes. Uh, you have a, a parent class up here so students can continue their education. You have multiple pathways for those students that don't always achieve like every other student. You know, we have re-engagement of these students. We continue to develop pathways. You have a dual language program at one of your elementary schools. We're working in the district capacity project to talk about expanding that to other languages that are prominent in our Brockton district. You continue to offer the parent choices. So one of the things that we've felt, we've felt this for a number of years, is there really is no reason for a charter to come to Brockton unless it's a Horace Mann charter that allows us to offer even another opportunity. And as I said, even as we sit here and speak, we continue to look at those, uh, those opportunities for innovation and Horace Mann charter, which are district-owned charter schools. And the other good news for us is as we look at our district, we talk about, talked about the growth this year, we're talking about our facility needs. It allows us to understand the population that we're dealing with at each of the levels, looking at the students coming up. And it allows us to plan short-term goals. It allows us to look at a 20-year plan with the students that we have here. So I, I'm very pleased this evening. And again, it's the hard work of our teachers, our principals, our leadership team, um, and again, we'll continue. We will give you a much longer presentation so that you can see school by school. And we'll talk to you about some of the uh, support that we'll give to the schools that we have concern about. That's great news. Mr. Minicello. Um, I would like to also commend all of the staff, teachers, administrators out there who are basically you know, on the front lines with respect to our students. Um, the role of the school committee is, in my opinion, um, to assist you, to try to provide you with resources so that our kids can succeed. And I don't think that um, anyone in any other community could uh, ask for a better teaching staff than we have here in Brockton. I think that if, if you can make it in Brockton, you can make it anywhere as far as I'm concerned. Um, and um, from my standpoint, um, you've made, I think, the city proud, you've made the school committee proud, and um, you, um, should be, you should get a pat on the back for that. Um, the parents should be very pleased, and I think that, um, I think somehow we need to, I think we need to get the word out in a tasteful and informative way to our, to our parents and our community, because this is something I think to be very proud of coming from Brockton. Um, we all, I think, in this community value the Brockton Public Schools, and um, I just think we should share this good news with, with our community and our, our parents and, and let the people that know, know that we do appreciate their efforts. It's not unnoticed. Well, as I said, we just received this news, but more importantly, even I, I know you're talking about our MCAS results, the continued hard work that goes on. So at our executive team meeting today, we were talking about looking at our level two schools, looking, and of course, you know how I feel about Brockton High. You look at one subcategory and you would have a level one school at Brockton High. So again, we, we are looking for ways and we do want to get out there. We want to, we're talking about going to our schools to congratulate our teachers and our staff for, for the hard work that they're doing each and every day. Yeah, I just think there should be some sort of a formal recognition or rollout or something to just show that we you know, we're proud of the, the efforts that have been made and we notice them. And um, I'll get back to you. We'll, yeah, we, we're, we, we're we, need, to, we need to do some that. planning. Uh, Mrs. Joyce is good at parties. We'll have her plan a party. <laughs> 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 we're so, very pleased. But uh, very much appreciated. I think just a quick comment in the short term, uh, part of the good news for me is 
well, the superintendent and I met this morning, one of the topics on our agenda was preparing for the upcoming debate regarding the uh, proposed charter school. And I think that, you know, in a year that budget-wise has been a difficult year, and we know that everyone is short-handed, and a lot of people are working very hard, I, I think it's uh, really good news that uh, not just the superintendent, but a lot of folks won't have to expend the time and energy that we would have put into this fight. And we can continue to focus on what we're doing and uh, continue to improve and, and not have to. I remember, you know, I was here for the last two, so it really takes a lot of extra time and work and effort and travel, and uh, it's, it's been a big effort to, uh, to hold off the last two applications. And I wasn't really relishing the idea of uh, doing it again, particularly in the middle of such a, a year that has had a lot of challenges. So I think it's, um, there are, there's a lot of good news here tonight, both in uh, the MCAS results that, uh, or the, the quick MCAS results that Ethan shared with us, and, uh, but also this, um, I think, a little bit unexpected uh, piece of good fortune that we, we don't have to deal with the, with the charter school debate this year. So I'm, I'm, I'm real happy. Dr. Cancel shared with me today after last year, every time something happened, he said this has never happened. The bus strike, the district, it, it went on and on. So he's told me today my luck has changed. So yeah. we're, we're on the upswing. Anyone else? Okay, thank you, Dr. Cancel. Thank you. It really I, was a quick update. It was. Yeah. Did Next is on to our budget update. Um, we did um, have a finance subcommittee meeting just last week. Um, we were sent back to the drawing board to continue to look at some of the concerns that you had after October 1st. We were looking at staffing. You've asked me to look at programs. We're talking about options. You asked about possibly academic support. We talked about the middle school sports. We talked about materials and supplies. All of that is happening at our executive team. We'd like to schedule at some point. Um, and when I say another finance meeting, um, Mrs. Joyce had talked about sometime after October. Um, we were hoping to do it maybe before a school committee meeting, and we could update you. We can certainly get to that, but that is the budget update, is that we are working to provide a menu of options that we can have some discussion about, set some priorities, and start to think a little bit outside the box as far as looking at some of the cuts we've made and maybe being a little bit creative is how we might bring back some opportunities for kids. Um, it obviously is not going to be all the things that we had for kids, but we do want to uh, share that. So we are back at the drawing board taking a look um, at our budget items. We do have another meeting in October. I don't think we have any things scheduled before that. Tonight, maybe we can sit and sure. find. I've got a couple of things I'd like to talk under subcommittees. Okay. Under the strategic plan update, um, I'd like to invite uh, Deputy Superintendent Barry to come up. I do want to talk about um, a company that you received information uh, in your packet this past Friday about the uh, U.S. Education Delivery Institute and a group that is uh, from, again, the Washington, D.C. This is uh, at no cost to the district, the DESC. Um, asked Brockton if they would like to get involved uh, with this uh, education collaborative group. We've had them in a couple of times, and we're really pleased as far as, as far as implementing our strategic plan and working with them as partners. And they're supporting our plan. They're not coming in and changing it, but they're coming in and helping to resource us to make sure we're moving that agenda forward. And before I have Deputy Superintendent just update you quickly, I do want to mention to you that um, as of October 1st, we made our final decision. Now, we had made a decision on going forward with PARC, but what we've done at this point, it gave us an opportunity to let the DESE know what schools would be actually using technology, what schools for PARC would be using paper and pencil. So our update for PARC, um, we're going to continue, obviously, with the Hancock and the Raymond that we had outfitted last year with technology. We will add the Huntington. We will add uh, the Downey School, and we will add the Ashfield School this year. I wish we could add more. At this point, those will be the schools that will use the technology part of PARC. It will allow us to see this new generation of testing. The other schools uh, that are, would have been taking MCAS and now will take PARC will use paper and pencil. And to remind everybody that Brockton High School will only be taking MCAS, and that will be your grade 10 test or the retest that happen. 
So, so I'll talk about EDI, and then if you have any questions about EDI or park, I'll just kind of sit tight. Um, EDI was introduced to us by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education because they had done some work with them over the years um, in regards to some of the um, implementation that they were doing at the state level. Um, and the intent originally was for them to come and, and um, assist us with our educator evaluation or our teacher and leader evaluation process. Um, when they came and met with us, we actually pitched that evaluation was part of a much larger plan in Brockton, and we had done so much work to actually establish um, and design a strategic plan that we really didn't want to work on one piece, but we wanted to work on all of it. Um, they are actually funded by the Gates Foundation, so as Superintendent Smith said, um, their, their feedback and their consultancy is, is of no cost to the district. Um, and I think it's probably a little bit of John Jerome in me, you know, having that mentoring. Um, I was definitely skeptical. They came and, and they, they pitched to us and, and we asked some really hard questions because we wanted to make sure that if we were going to work with them, they were really going to pay attention to what we did all of last year to really develop the strategic plan. Um, the objectives of their partnership definitely appealed to us. Um, they said they have a philosophy of putting themselves out of business. Um, their goal is to set up a series um, of systems and routines to carry the work forward so that they can leave. Um, and that's not a typical um, educational consultant. That, that's not how they usually operate. Um, what we like about it so far is that it's a combination of in-person um, support for the district, but also a lot, a lot is done virtually and online. And we sent them everything that took place last year. The district review, the entry plan, the transition planning, um, and um, even, even the, the work that came as a result of the listening tours that Superintendent Smith conducted um, last year. Any kind of feedback that we had from them, we definitely got the impression that they were reading things carefully and that they're already really thinking about how they can support the Brockton Public Schools in implementing the strategic plan. Um, they seem very responsive and very flexible, which is, which is important to us. So we're in the process right now of establishing two in-person dates um, that will really kick off their involvement with us, but we're not wasting any time with the um, impl implementation of the strategic plan. Um, we have a group actually being led by Dr. Murray and um, Mrs. Saber McGuire and Dr. Cancel, of course, where they're actually revising the school improvement planning process to be more reflective of the district strategic plan. We will also take the school improvement plan and we will tweak it so that we are looking at schools and how they interpret the strategic plan, but also departments within the district as well. Um, and I think that working with this outside organization that really specializes in delivery, um, it's going to get at some of those things that some of the concerns that were expressed actually here. How do you know you're doing the right things? You know, what kind of data are you using? Um, and they're going to be able to help us to really look at that and also use um, their experience with other districts uh, across the country, which would be helpful. Do you have any questions about EDI or park testing? Um. You answered some of my questions, like about how did they all of a sudden get here. Right. That was one of them. So Desi recommended them. Um, so are they a private company, or are they some sort of a governmental connected entity with the Department um, of La um, Department of Education? The I'm name not sure. sounds like. They're, they're the U.S. Education Delivery. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I just know that they're funded by the Gates Foundation. One of the things that they actually had to do was once we kind of changed the plan, um, they had to go back and pitch the new, the new kind of concept to them um, to make sure that they would continue to have it funded. But I'm not quite sure so, the origin of that. So my guess is that they're private, I think. Uh, okay. Ethan, did you want to um, share your connection with the folks at EDI? Come on up. Quickly, come on up. Be quick again. <laughs> well, my dad said that I move like molasses on a slow day, so this is a... Uh, <laughs> he, he went to Wisconsin, so I think that might have come from there. Okay, so my personal connection is the uh, Massachusetts Department of Education 
adopted this model. And my former student, when I was a professor, is the person who's in charge of it. So I asked him, I said, Matt, wh what do you think of this? Mm -hmm. And he said, it's really great. It, it really is. And um, they are a private company. As Liz pointed out, you know, we put all of our cards on the table. Yeah. One of our concerns, they're Gates funded. And so they say, we're, we're ideology free, but when you know who's funding them, you say, okay, that well. That was another question. What's their charter? What's their mission statement? They are, they're, they're from McKinsey Consulting, and their whole thing is most education agencies and, you know, the local school districts are not very good at project management. We, in, in our schools of, graduate schools of education, we don't get taught how to manage $200 million organizations. We get taught about how to teach, how to you know, manage a school building. But so that, they saw that need and they said, that's our niche, that's our expertise. So Gates said, yeah, that's true. And so they, they gave them the money and they've been working on it. And they, they do have a nice track record. They, they're doing this work across the country. They've been successful um, in a number of places and again, First hand, I know the Department of Education in Massachusetts. So I'm as skeptical as anyone, but I, I, I was favorably impressed. And uh, what, what they're offering fits very neatly into the things that we're pushing. You know, the superintendent and the deputies are pushing accountability, sort of, I'll call it project management, but it's making sure that people are getting all the things done because it's so tight, we're understaffed, things like that. You really have to keep on top of many, many, many different plates that you're spinning in the air at the same time. I'm not, I'm not, I don't think the word is skeptical. I'm curious. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm, I'm not skeptical. Right. I'm just curious. I just would like to know if you could just find out just a little bit more about them, who they are, you know, what their charter is. Um, and then, um, and again, I don't want to look a gift course in the mouth. I mean, if it's something that this team thinks is advantageous for Brockton Public Schools, then mm -hmm. you have my blessing. I mean, well, that's I'm great. Share with you, if at any time we choose not to go forward, yeah, we can yeah, we can I mean, take out it. There's nothing right. that they've given us that we can't say that's not the direction we want to go in. Like we're not locked into any type of, I mean, there's no cost, but I mean, it doesn't seem like there's some sort of and agreement that we have to commit to. And it's not long term. So, they right. want to yeah. resource us to make sure that we're moving in the direction that the strategic plan becomes embedded. They'll share with us project management from the superintendent, you know, to the leadership team, down to the schools, involving the community and the parents. Yeah. So it is truly a plan, and then that's what we talked about in the beginning, that's fluid that can change, right. you know, depending on the needs of our schools. So, uh, you know, I'm hoping that that's the expertise that they'll continue and, to share. And, and just, just to reiterate sort of what their process is, they come in, it's a consulting model. It's McKinsey Consulting come to the public sector. They do a needs assessment. They, you know, again, no cost to us. They come in and say, okay, this is, these are your plans. This is what you want to do. Here's where some strengths and weaknesses are. And then they teach you a methodology. And that's basically what they do. Right. And then, then they, they help you work that methodology and then they are gone. My final question, and I think I've surmised what the answer is, but how would you envision implementation of whatever it is that they produce? But I guess you'd first need to take it slow and figure out what exactly they are going to, you know, provide, if anything, well, and, no. and then figure out how later on to incorporate that or weave it into some sort of professional development or some sort of well, strategic planning or well, administrative Liz, plan right. or implementation. Liz actually articulated, and she can go into it even more, but the idea was there are things, very big projects that we have to do. Things like Eddie Val. You have to make sure every single person in the district knows who they're going to evaluate, has been evaluated, has turned in all the stuff that needs to be done for evaluation. All the data is all correct. It, you know, the, the person who's come back from maternity leave is now back in the system. All those things. 
how you manage that, that's one of the, the many big projects we have. Then we have this, this strategic plan, the superintendent's strategic plan. Yes, we're, we're working on the SIP and integrating it into the strategic plan, but are we doing this systematically? Are we getting it out to all the schools? Is it, is it touching the classrooms? That to me is sort of the work that this process can facilitate. But right. Right. No, and I mean, it's exactly that. I mean, one of the things that's, that's appealing to us, and, and we certainly put them through the ringer a little bit, but in, a, in a polite way, of course, but um, it's, it's appealing to us because it's, it's the day-to-day -day stuff, and, and everyone is so busy with the day-to-day -day stuff, they're really going to help us with the long-range planning that needs to take place and how pieces of that long-range planning become part of that routine, that day-to-day. So, um, you know, it, we're encouraged, and, and if we feel differently at any point in time, they want to be working in districts that will f find a benefit, and so they're also looking for that reward. They want it to be a good match, um, and, and I can appreciate that. Um, and so far, things have gone really well, um, but as I said, we have a couple of more in-person sessions to schedule, and we'll be able to get you some more information as these things unfold. I wanted to, because you asked, you know, if we could do more research. If you've ever worked for Kathy Smith, the first thing she says is, I want to know a little more about, <laughs> and then, you know, this much little more about. They, I, I failed to mention this, they come from a British sort of model. I forget right now the name of their founder who was with McKinsey, but he was also with the British Department of Education. And they're really ahead of us in terms of accountability. Um, the whole inspection of schools, that's a British idea that made its way over to America. And you know they're well beyond that now. So this is coming out of a, the British um, government, basically. And it, it's, I, I, meant, I meant to tell you that. It, we did do our due diligence on those guys. That's how I looked up and saw, OK, who's funding them? And I said, ah, OK, all the dots are connecting. The, the person in charge of Gates Education is from Kentucky. That's how Kentucky got, got in. She used to work for the Department of Kentucky. She was the Secretary of Education in Pennsylvania. So we did do our, our homework on it. But um, the, I think it's just clever naming the U.S. I mean, because the guy who's in charge is Sir whatever his name is. He's British. But it also sort of gives this patina that it's associated with the government. It's not. Well, if, um, if you move forward and later on um, there is an opportunity that they are in district um, and you think it's appropriate, feel free to throw them on the agenda. And, okay. You know, it might be nice to see what they have to offer in person and hear from them, you know, then if you feel that okay. it's not worth it, then don't bother. Okay. And the other, the other thing that we'll say, I, I know you're all um, busy, um, <laughs> but when they come out to do in-person sessions, they would certainly be amenable. Again, they've been very, very flexible um, to connecting with some of you. If you have any um, interest to do that, that's absolutely something that we could do um, when they are here. what they were doing yeah yeah that that that's the uh, they're they have a pretty proven track record and the the British were able to move far you know they really made some substantial improvements in their public education which they don't call public public schools in Britain for some reason are private but but they really did make some great gains and as I said they're not new at doing this in the United States um, what is new is the concept they can't, a, a rough thing to say, but here it is, these are the facts. A McKinsey consultant would go out of business trying to apply what they do to education because we can't pay their rates. You know, $2,000 an hour for a McKinsey partner just is not doable in public education. It is doable for, you know, corporations. So Gates is essentially subsidizing this work. 
The other thing that um, we liked was that when they were talking about what kind of results they've had, um, they frame their positive results based on how have they built capacity in districts that eventually gets to improve student achievement or better results for kids. And we can appreciate that they actually go there and use that as their measure for their success. That's not often what you get when you're working with consultants. Yeah. My thoughts were that maybe they were trying to come up with some kind of a uh, general result that most systems across the country could either use or at least aspire to uh, with Gates or whomever supporting that and making public education better you know, across the country for, for no cost to the, to, to the individual districts when you think about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next item uh, under the report of the superintendent of schools, I am so proud to bring this to you again. It's, this is just a good night. Um, our adult learning center, and again, as director of community schools, I had the privilege of working alongside first Dr. Linda Faria Braun and now Suzanne Martin, who is our coordinator of the adult learning center. We know what it provides to our community. We know about the long waiting list. We always have questions about that because our citizens want opportunities for English as a second language, for citizenship classes, for adult basic education classes. Um, you know, previously our GED was offered at our adult learning center. So news came to us, and I know you received this again in your bulletin, but I wanted to highlight it tonight, that um, the Brockton uh, Adult Education Center received the maximum number of points based on the ESE's uh, Adult and Community Learning Services Program performance standards. And these measure learning gains that our adults make on state assessments, attaining their goals, their attendance, and a number of other factors. So with that perfect score, they continue to be ranked as a Tier 1 program in the state. And they've been a Tier 1 program for, I think, seven of the uh, past eight years. So I know our coordinator, Suzanne Martin, is here. I want to congratulate her, uh, Kathy Quinn, their staff, and you continue to make us proud. And what is the waiting list, Suzanne? It's up to 2,000. And unfortunately, like every budget, that has also suffered cuts, and we continue to offer, unfortunately, less and less classes, and the need continues to grow. And I know if you heard Soraya presenting earlier tonight, you talk, if you took a look at some of those numbers, even as far as our students coming in, a lot of them are English language learners, and we know they come with parents that clearly want to learn the English language so they can also realize the American dream. So we'll continue to work on this, but again, I want to congratulate our Adult Learning Center. Okay, and our last, um, we go from that to I'm sure every one of you is watching every night as I am on the news, whether it's the enterovirus, which we're trying to keep ahead of and work uh, with our supervisor of nurses, uh, Linda Cahill, uh, Dr. Sal Tarasi's office. Now, most recently, they ta we talk about Ebola. And, you know, is it getting closer? And one of the things we looked at recently where they were talking about countries and high-risk areas and again, when you talk about children come to Brockton from all over the globe, so we want you to know a little bit about our plan for addressing this, our protocols, and again, letting our parents know that we're, we're watching this, we're looking to support them, and we're looking to make sure that we continue to be educated on, on these topics. So I think, again, there's a short uh, presentation. Good evening. Um, a couple weeks ago, I was asked to talk about enterovirus. Um, so there's been so much of it in the news. We've had a lot of parent phone calls about um, that health, the health concern of the virus and also the Ebola virus that has um, come into the United States. So I'm going to do a brief presentation. And please ask any questions that you want during the presentation. So the, uh, first I'll talk about enterovirus D68. So this virus was first identified in, in 1962. It's um, one of 100 subset enteroviruses. 
Um, it's transmitted by respiratory disease, so um, that's respiratory secretions. Um, symptoms include coughing, wheezing, shortness of breath. Um, you might have diarrhea, you might have vomiting, excuse me for being so blunt, um, <laughs> rash. Um, the patient may have a fever or they may not have a fever. Um, and as you know, if you've seen in the news, there's been some um, patients that have neurological symptoms, the polio-like symptoms, where they can't feel their limbs. So according to the CDC, as of today, um, we've had uh, 44 states throughout the uh, country have enterovirus, um, 628 confirmed cases. We have one confirmed child death in New Jersey as of Friday, um, and they're, they're doing some more investigations of other deaths, if it's definitely enterovirus D68 or if it's other. There was a child in Rhode Island that um, passed um, from a staph infection and also had enterovirus too. Massachusetts does have confirmed cases. I don't know the number. It's not listed on the CDC website as far as Massachusetts or DPH website. So patients with, a, um, with enterovirus, the most highest risk patients are patients that have a history of asthma or respiratory um, or immune compromise. They seem to get sicker quicker. Um, so we have to watch out for these patients in particular. Um, the only patients that are being tested are hospitalized patients, and um, the testing consists of specific lab tests. It's a two-phase test. If a patient is hospitalized, they get um, secretions um, from their nasal pharynx and their um, larynx, and then if it's positive for enterovirus, then it gets sent out for the subset um, to check for D68. So treatment is symptomatic. Um, Over-the-counter medication is given for cough and fever. Um, we stress in, the, in our nurses' offices here that if any patient is wheezing, uh, short of breath, any neurological symptoms, um, they need to seek medical care right away. Um, especially if they're having any uh, problems with thinking, problems with sensation, motion, seizures, that's a definite, a seizure is definite 911 call. Um, they may have to be hospitalized, which they'll get bronchodilators, which help open up the airways. They may need oxygen. They may need IV fluids. They may need supportive care. Um, they may need to have um, more treatment within the hospital. And there is no vaccine. So protecting ourselves, um, Superintendent um, Smith had put out a, an advisory. We want to encourage everybody to wash their hands frequently, 20 seconds. Um, especially in coming in contact with respiratory secretions and changing diapers. Avoid touching the eyes, nose, and mouth in, with unwashed hands. Avoid kissing, hugging, sharing cups, or eating utensils with people who are sick. Encourage coughing into your elbow. Cleaning and di disinfecting uh, frequently touched surfaces such as toys and doorknobs, especially if someone's sick. And um, we stress infection control in the school system. Our nurses' offices teach it at the beginning of the year um, in, in every school. So as far as nursing services go, any child that has a fever goes home. Of 100.4 or greater, they must be fever-free for at least 24 hours before returning to school. If the child is coughing excessively or vomiting, they need to go home also. We encourage parents to keep sick children at home and seek medical care for evaluation and treatment. We need to know if there's any confirmed cases of enterovirus D68, and I'm trying to see if there's any increases um, of, if there's any diagnosis of flu. So far, we don't have any <coughs> confirmed cases within the system, so far. Okay, let's talk about Ebola. That seems to be a hot um, topic. Ebola virus, it's, it's an acute viral illness. The other name for it is hemorrhagic fever. It first appeared in 1976. Um, the, the, the most current outbreak was in um, West Africa in March of 2014. And this is from the WHO website. So Ebola is transmitted through contact with bodily fluids of a symptomatic infected person. Risk is low, it's not airborne. So here's some facts about Ebola, and I do have some fact sheets here if you want copies of Ebola and some uh, from DPH on the D68, the um, enterovirus D68. So Ebola, you can't get Ebola through the air, you can't get Ebola through the water or through food. It's touching bodily secretions of an infected person. 
um, or touching needles or contaminated objects. So some of the symptoms are fever of 101.5 or greater, severe headaches, muscle pain, weakness, diarrhea, vomiting, abdominal pain, unexplained hemorrhaging, bleeding or bruising, um, and that's the biggest thing. Um, people bruise very easily and they, they have severe bleeding. So symptoms may appear anywhere from 2 to 21 days after exposure to Ebola. So I'm going to just give you case counts because I, I, I mean, we all should keep tabs on what's going on in the rest of the world. So these are the case counts as of October 3rd. So Liberia has, uh, in the 3,000 range, Sierra Leone has 2,400. Um, Guinea has uh, 1,199. Nigeria, 20 cases. One confirmed case in the United States in Texas, um, and I heard tonight that he's um, intubated, uh, which means he has a breathing tube down his throat to breathe. Um, he's very sick. And one case in Senegal, and I just heard there's also a case in Madrid. Um, so, and that wasn't noted on the CDC website. So total case count for the world is 7,492, 7, and the average fatality rate is 50%. And that's why this, this is being publicized so much, because of the fatality rate. But you have to realize that in other countries, we don't have as great health care as we do it in the United States. Um, if you've watched the news, um, sanitation isn't, isn't as great as, as it is here in the United States. Um, and getting people to the hospital, it, it's, it's not as quick as within the states here. So that's why there's so much publicity about this virus. Um, so treatment is basically keep the person hydrated. They may need blood products. Um, they mean they'll need supportive care. Um, they, they're trying to get the person's immune response to kick in. There's some experimental drugs they're using. Um, they might get immunoglobulins to help boost the immune response. Um, and they say that if you recover, then your antibodies should last at least 10 years. And again, there's no vaccine for this yet. So what are we doing in the school system? We're trying to be proactive as far as the Ebola, first of all, because um, as you know, the person in Texas, well, he lied on his screening at the airport. So what if that happens? To us, we need to be proactive about it. So we did have a meeting the other day um, with Soraya De Barros, is she still here? And um, Mike Thomas um, to talk about this. Um, so this is what, what we've decided we're going to do. So parent registration always screens the new new um, students coming in. So the highest risk countries are Sierra Leone, Guinea, Lib Liberia, and Nigeria. So. The question they're going to ask is, they always ask what country they're from, but if they're from any of these countries, then they will ask if um, we can get documentation from a doctor that they've been screened for Ebola. If, and they will ask if they've been in contact with anyone from Ebola. If there's a positive contact, then Mike Thomas is to be notified and he's going to call the Board of Health right then and there. Um, and the Board of Health then in turn will and contact who they need to, whether it be DPH, CDC. Um, and then we'll, um, we'll notify appropriate parties. Um, and I'm sure if there, I'm praying to God there isn't never a case in our area, but um, we'll be, we're, we'll, we're trying to be ready for it. So um, our, we have a team approach as far as the school system goes, as far as uh, disease prevention and control, um, starting with parent registration. Um, we have health educators that teach about prevention um, and healthy lifestyles. We have the school staff. Our nursing staff talks about infection control, and the staff within the schools um, perform infection and appropriate infection control. Um, our nurses wear gloves when they have to touch any bodily fluids. Our, um, some of our paraprofessionals wear gloves when they are changing diapers as need be in the special ed classrooms. Our custodians wear gloves when they're um, using any, when they're cleaning bathrooms and whatnot. Um, so our nurses, besides teaching infection control, they also do case management, follow up with the parents, follow up with the doctors. I'm doing case tracking, and I keep my eyes on the rest of the world as far as what's going on and what's, what, what we need to pay attention to. 
and Mike Thomas, thank you for um, being so helpful um, as far as supplying the schools with um, hand sanitizer and soap in every single bathroom um, and hand sanitizer in every classroom. And there's extra from what I understand. So this is just the posters that are, have been sent out to all the principals and to the nursing staff so they can post um, in every bathroom and the nurses' offices on when you should wash your hands. And that's it. Is there any questions? Yes. Well, Colin, what you brought up in your presentation as new countries, new places get mentioned, maybe CDC isn't picking up quick enough, or if it's over a weekend, again, they may not pick it up. So is that something that you would include once it's confirmed, yes. even though they don't yes. have it? Did you folks have a, um, a plan for similar diseases a few years ago, almost every government agency, schools and stuff were putting uh, pandemic plans together because that's something that may also be helpful, that same type of plan. Uh, and if we had a major <coughs> hit on a building for some reason, uh, there are plans to deal with that. Well, as you remember, H1N1 was right. hot and heavy, I don't know how many years ago it was. Yeah, so we had plans in place. Then um, we also started to run clinics to give the appropriate immunizations against the H1N1. But um, we still we still need to be a little bit more clear as far as meeting. As if if this did happen here, mm -hmm. then we'd have to get more direction from Department of Public Health and the CDC. Um, we work very closely um, with Tobias in the REMS grant and he's he's really on top of his um, on his emergency planning and that's one of the things that we have to develop a little bit more I think and then the what I call marketing getting back to the parents the maximum information we can so that they can be in tune with what's going on I know it's everywhere but sometimes some of the parents may not for whatever reason see public service announcements whether it be regular news or PSAs or whatever it may be so uh, hopefully we're doing that also to try to get information back out. And do you have, at this point, enough, I'll call it medical supplies, health supplies for the staff to deal with whatever, as you mentioned, gloves and those kinds of things? Yeah, we have plenty of gloves. Um, my, we don't have enough masks if we had to. That was to, my next question. Yeah. Are you using 95s, um, M95s? What are you using? We just have, we don't have masks in every building. We don't. Um, we would have to really, I mean, it's, it's a huge, it's a huge expense. I'm well aware huge of that. Huge expense. <laughs> so, and as you've seen on the news, um, in um, West Africa, as far as they're, they're using hazmat suits and all that. Yeah. I mean, if we ever had to deal with that, we, we would, we would um, start incident command and all that um, and call in the CDC and then they'd have to help us. So, um, yeah, that's what we'd have to do. The reason I ask that, it's like any emergency, if someone really appears, as that gentleman did in Texas, he went home, he showed the extreme signs of the disease, and at that point, everything that he was doing then became a potential hazard zone, i.e., just like you said, at that point, you, you have to move to the maximum protection uh, and even calling somebody in, I don't know if there's how many people are trained here at the school for that or if we have a few or any kinds of uh, materials that way so that if need be, uh, one could deal with those things and then properly know what to do with those items as they dealt with them to prevent any you know, further contamination, et cetera. So. Well, they have drills within Brockton and um, I know we've, I've at times I haven't participated in a drill, but I know that like Brockton Emergency Management, mm -hmm. they have those drills at the ho at the hospital. Um, I haven't participated, but I mean that's something that we should probably yeah. look and, and into. If if we any one of our schools or anything that we deal with, if it hit that particular place, waiting for somebody to come, you know, is sometimes problematic depending on who it is. So my suggestion would be to maybe find out if possible what and where and how and what we would do in those cases because time is of the essence with Correct. contamination if nothing else. Yeah. So. Mr. Head, 
tonight. Um, this was a concern of mine a couple weeks ago when I read it in the news and I brought it to the superintendents. Um, uh, a couple questions I have. Um, if a child was to develop D68 and go into a hospital, God, God forbid, um, how does the notification work? Is it, a, is it a voluntary notification upon the parents? Does the CDC notify a school system? How, how does I don't that think work? it's mandated that they let us know. Um, so we could have no idea right. because a parent just decides or it slips their mind because their right. child is sick. Right. So the last thing they're thinking of is I should tell this person and that person, et cetera. So our biggest thing is if the child's sick, they stay at home and they should be yeah. symptom free. Um, so um, no child that has a fever should be in school. We send them home um, and we try every effort to get them home if they do have a fever. And our policy di dictates that the child should be fever, fever free for, for 24 hours without vomiting for 24 hours. Um, any excessive coughing, they should go home. So if it's disruptive, like if the child is coughing severely that it's keeping them awake at night, they shouldn't be in school. Or if it's disruptive in the classroom, they should go home you know, and be seen by a doctor. Yeah. So. And the, the other question I had is just kind of the cleaning, you know, piece of it, you know. Um, you mentioned a lot of, you know, those, uh, the, the, the tables, desk chairs, et cetera, get cleaned, et cetera. Um, what about toys and instructional materials that the kids use? Is that sanitized in, in any way? I honestly don't know that answer, but I can get you that answer. Mike, would you know that answer? The toys in the classroom, how often? Yeah. I mean, it's kids. I mean, they touch things, they lick things, they. <laughs> One of the things we've talked about is when you talk about, you know, the soap and water or the hand sanitizer, you know, it has to have a certain percentage of bleach or. Alcohol. 60%. 60% or greater. 70%. I think it's 70% or greater. We were looking at some kind of wipes. Uh, again, it's, it's very costly, as uh, Linda mentioned about the masks. But I had mentioned to the mayor, I've had some discussions with a couple of the local uh, health providers. Maybe they can help us out with some of these things. So we, we have a sample uh, of wipes that you keep in a classroom to wipe the doorknob, to maybe wipe down the desks, and to get kids in that habit. Um, again, I'm not sure what the cost is on this, but uh, I do have on my desktop to make a phone call to a couple of the people that had offered some support. So I, I didn't realize the masks were a concern, so I'll, I'll ask on a couple of fronts. I, just as a, a, a point, when we had H1N1, we bought, I can't tell you how many masks, thousands, and they sat in closets. Um, they just turned bad, they mm -hmm. turned yellow, right. because we have them. Um, so I know we were prepared, but um, I don't know if we want to spend that much money on mm -hmm. and if for something that may happen, I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. Something you know, reasonable anyway. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else? Ms. Tominicelli. To the Board of Health, and perhaps they have some sort of a uh, source that they could provide us some um, donated equipment or they, they have access to certain resources so maybe Mike or someone could reach I, out. I can make a call but I know when we went through H1N1 there was some grant funding that did come down to provide us with with you know reimbursement if we did spend money on mass but I don't know if that's available I can call them and find out. Great and um, I mean just a, a simple thing you know when a nurse at one of the schools knows that a child's gone home because of certain symptomology, um, make it a point to follow up with the family and find out what's going on with that child. Exactly. Um, you know, just sort of a housekeeping yeah. thing, but I'm sure you will do that. And it, it yeah, we do that. And another thing, um, if a parent starts saying, my child has enterovirus D68, I've stressed to the nurses, make a phone call talk to that parent, see if it's a confirmed case, see if they went to the hospital. So that's what they're doing. So. And Thank we'll you. continue to keep the lines of communication open with parents as we get information. You know, we'll be very careful, you know, to continue to share. Uh, we've had a couple of Connect Ed messages out there. Um, and you know, knock on wood, we've, we've been okay at this point. Thank 
Thank you. And I just on the items to refer to subcommittee, I know we had talked about a retreat on October 25th. It's a Saturday. I don't have a full team able to be there with some things that I do need to share with you. The new discipline law, there's a number of things that we're starting to uh, work into our agenda for the retreat. Um, I would like to ask that we reschedule that, uh, possibly sometime in November. We'll take a look at your schedules. That was gonna be a Saturday morning, but we thought we might take a look at the possibility of doing that facility tour um, in the morning uh, of the 25th, but we'll get back to, we do need to connect with the city council. Anyone else send items to refer to subcommittee? Any requests? I know we haven't been having enough subcommittee meetings lately, so. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess then we'll move on to uh, new business. Mr. Jordan. Yes. I wanted to report out that I was at a uh, meeting that last Wednesday, the 1st of October, uh, Wednesday night it was over at the uh, Charlie Horse uh, establishment in West Bridgewater. <coughs> Excuse me, it was the Massachusetts Association of School Committees, and we are Division Three. We are a member of. And that particular night, there was approximately 50 people or so there from the southeast area, and a lot of the local towns around us and a few of the other cities uh, had representation there. They provided us with a discussion guide uh, for the upcoming um, conference they're having in early uh, November. And I believe Tom and myself will be, I'm the delegate to that, Tom's the alternate. And that's a four day um, conference. So what they would particularly were dealing with here was a general explanation of proposed changes to bylaws and proposed resolutions. And if I may just take a, a minute or two just to read the outlines of the uh, the seven uh, resolutions are up. The first one was greater transparency and accountability for out of district costs. The second was universal quality pre kindergarten access in Massachusetts. The third was charter school reform. The fourth was fingerprinting. The fifth was reinstitution uh, of earmarking. The sixth was unfunded mandates in new testing, and the last was assessment systems in Massachusetts. And they did have resolutions for each one of these. We've had discussions on most of these materials so far. The one thing during the discussion that they did not bring up, even though we'd submitted letters and our congressional people had signed off on uh, uh, proposed bills that should go in for changes of the formula, was the, which was mentioned, when the school year starts and then you pick up X amount of students, that cost that comes, and again, it, you don't get reimbursed to the following year. It seemed like I was the only one bringing that up, although once I did, everybody else said yes. So in essence, that was the report uh, I wanted to bring back to you and show that you know, we did con contribute something to that group. Anybody has any questions or anything? Um, you know, in public no, schools, exactly when you talk right. about unfunded mandates, testing, uh, the universal uh, pre-K discussion, I looked at their agenda. I thought it was an excellent agenda. Yeah. Sometimes you get used to seeing the same things over and over again. So for those four days, I know it's posted. Um, if people have opportunities, I know I'm going to try to attend and you know go to a number of them. I think yeah. they do an excellent job. The other thing they brought up was park, and that was a big discussion. In the, those schools who have opted to, to be on or not be on. So it was quite interesting. And again, we've had these discussions, we've had uh, presentations on them. So we were kind of ahead of the curve on all this, which was very good, so. When we were voting for the delegate, I don't remember any mention of the meeting at the Charlie Horse was gonna be involved. <laughs> yeah. I, I must was, have missed that. that was the During the nomination was process. Uh, the school committee. <laughs> to that one, that one. The, the meeting at the Charlie Horse before he goes to the meeting down the Cape. Yeah, yeah, all right. Yeah, <laughs> and he's the new guy. I um, have to know, I have to figure out. <laughs> yeah. Anything else on a new business? Okay, anything on the unfinished business, Mr. Minichello? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we usually don't have any unfinished business. Um, 
Well, we, um, we had a very uh, beneficial, I think, uh, curriculum subcommittee meeting with respect to substance abuse and with respect to what we're doing at all levels with uh, the health department and um, the programs that we have. Um, and we also had a very good offer and presentation with respect to the great program. Uh, my question is, following it up, have we made any, taken any steps or made any progress or where are we at? Because the committee voted in order to want some interaction and implementation if pro possible. We put a group together. I think the, is it coming up this week? I'm losing track. It, we have a meeting that is set. Great. So we, as I said to you, we will get back to you with a plan for incorporating some lessons into either elective classes, working with our health classes, um, and we will present so we'll know the involvement uh, with the great curriculum uh, in our health and wellness curriculum. We even had a, um, in our meeting with some of the um, uh, participants with NEASC, um, with the school committee, substance abuse came up, you know, and all of these out of district people from Connecticut to Rhode Island, a gentleman from New Hampshire, certainly mass representation. We all agree that this is a an issue that every community, every New England state anyways that was in that room with us, you know, is going through. So it's something that um, um, you know, I just want to try to address and continue to go in the right direction and do whatever we can within our means to try to prevent, you know, some tragedies from happening. So, so I thank you for your uh, continued effort. I'm actually, um, so with the presentation with great, you said within our means, the important thing is that there's no cost. Uh, we already have a dozen police officers trained and certified. Um, and it's simply a matter of uh, making a very small amount of time, perhaps an average of uh, four classes a year, something like that in the middle school grades, in order to introduce this curriculum. And great has changed over the years. So you, when you mention the substance abuse problem, the GREAT curriculum is also an anti-substance abuse curriculum, along with being an anti-gang curriculum. It's, it's, as you guys saw, it's, uh, it's built around um, self-esteem, decision-making, resisting peer pressure, developing decision-making skills in kids so that hopefully when they're in a position that they have to make decisions that could affect the rest of their lives, they're better equipped to do it. So I think it's important that people realize great is not a cop standing in front of a bunch of kids saying, don't join a gang. Uh, it's nothing like that at all. It's, it's about working with kids on an age-appropriate basis from fourth grade right through middle school. And I believe it's at the middle school level, maybe 11 classes, which could be five one year and six the next if you did seventh and eighth grade or even as, as few as three or four a year if you spread it over three uh, class, three grade levels, grades six, seven, and eight. So I, I don't think it's a very big commitment we're asking for at all to make kids available for three or four classes a year to you know, provide this type of proven training at no cost to the schools. So I think, and I appreciate Superintendent that the, the school committee did uh, show their support for bringing this into the schools. And thank you. Mr. Jordan. Well, number one to that discussion, we were talking about um, incidents that have been happening starting in the summer right up through now with uh, youngsters, potentially youngsters uh, being involved with accidents with uh, vehicles. And we talked about doing something again uh, within the schools, doing some kind of publicity, et cetera, and I was wondering if we've moved on that in any way the mayor and myself today which is education training for our youngsters um, this will be the big billboard that's going up I think I had talked about it last time 
our kids, our streets, our responsibility, be aware, you know, drive with care, uh, never more pertinent than it certainly is now on the streets of, of not, not just our city, I think it's everywhere. It but we are working, you know, with our kids in classes. Uh, we shared that information with you. As I said today, we just signed, um, the mayor and myself, information that'll go into classrooms, that'll go home to parents, and it makes all of us aware that this is all our responsibility. Yeah, at the city level, we're working on a number of initiatives, too. So just in the past week, uh, I met with the Old Colony Planning Council. They've developed uh, a postcard size uh, piece that's pretty short, simple, and straightforward, but uh, pedestrian safety tips that are applicable to everybody. And uh, we're looking right now at what the cost would be to reproduce those in the tens of thousands and make them available throughout the city. Uh, I also last Friday met with the uh, highway supervisor of the Department of Transportation specifically to ask the state for help around pedestrian safety in some particular locations within the um, city, but also at a larger level in terms of education again. And um, he's going to be meeting with his traffic team, and they, but they do have some educational type programs and materials available and they're going to be coming back to Brockton with a proposal for what they may be able to do for us to get some assistance from the state transportation people and uh, and along that uh, superintendent you know a program that we've already have here in the Brockton schools the safe routes to schools program mm -hmm. uh, that we have and I believe four schools right now and at the the Brookfield school that program paid for brand new sidewalks from a number of the residential streets in the neighborhood leading into the school and uh, I did at least raise the possibility that due to the um, the tragic number of pedestrian accidents that we've had this year that perhaps the state might consider funding another school for sidewalks and uh, I didn't get an answer but he said he would you know would, would bring it back and there was a possibility so I think both on the school side and the city side we really are trying to identify what we can do to help. I don't think we can ever reduce the odds 100% because accidents happen, but I think we can reduce the likelihood of an accident happening uh, if we're proactive, and I think that's what we intend to do. I knew you met with Frank DiPolo, right. who many of you know is, uh, is a Brocktonian. He is. He attended Brockton High, I think grew that's up right. on Cambo Street, and uh, you know, I was pleased pleased to yeah. see that. And he still lives just outside the city, but he's uh, he, he's absolutely a Brockton guy and very concerned about the city and, and is going to see what he can do to help us with resources from the state level. Mr. Jordan. Suggestions. You mentioned the postcards. You may want to look. If we don't have the in-house capability, maybe Southeast Regional might. And as a project for them, that may uh, save us some dollars. And it's just a actual card material might be the only thing we may have to do. The other is um, most people, all ages, seem to like to listen to whatever they're listening to, which causes the great possibility and potential that you're not paying attention when you're walking, i.e. walking between cars, walking streets, sidewalks, etc., not being able to hear vehicles, warning signals, etc., and maybe something similar to uh, the, the little sign that you have there, something addressing that, that might be whimsical uh, with some of our children to realize that either one earphone instead of two, whatever, will lock out your total hearing, might be something that would be helpful, because I doubt if you could get folks to totally say no, but maybe they could have one in the ear, i.e. the other ear free to hear, you know, things coming might save a life or two in this process. Anyone else? I have to tell you, just in closing, today um, I had been to the Angelo School and to see the health curriculum in action and to, to listen from the younger children all the way up to the fifth graders at the Angelo School, the lessons that they were learning. We started to talk about protocols and I gave them an assignment to get back to me and share with me some best practices. And I haven't had a chance to fully look at it, but I have a song in front of me and the words are all there, so I'm really, I'm not sure if this is a rap or this is, 
but I have to really find this child and it might be something that we get to share with other school kids because they learn best from each other. So. Anything else under new business? Mr. Minicello. Counselor Tom Monahan. And I don't know who might know this, but he asked me if Brock, if he has, he could get the copies of the Brockton fight song lyrics. Do we have a, do we have lyrics to the Brockton fight song somewhere? We're trying to discourage <laughs> fighting, Mr. Marshall. Yes, I know that. <laughs> I don't know if you got the memo. But it's, there, it's, there, <laughs> it's Tom's 40th uh, reunion, I guess. So they're, they were a very feisty class, apparently. So. Yeah. Can we? Well, they, they have their 40th reunion. Well, Vinny has that's exactly what Can we Deputy do that and then get it over to Mr. Monahan, Councillor Monahan? Yeah. Mrs. Wilson, do you know it? <laughs> I don't remember it by heart any longer, but <laughs> definitely something that we do in March again. They have the music stuff there. Can you yeah. get in touch with uh, uh, Councillor Monahan? Yeah, I'll get it from Vinny. Mike, do you know the words? Yeah. No. no. <laughs> Where's your spirit? I think we need a new title for it. We shouldn't call it a fight song anymore, I don't think. <laughs> we'll get that for him. Mr. Henningsen. And just real quick, I just wanted to let the public know that uh, the Brockton High School Varsity Cheerleaders are going to be having a uh, fundraiser to benefit them on Sunday, October 12th from 1 to 4 at the Enterprise Club. Uh, it's going to be a meat raffle, food, cash bar, prizes, et cetera. So I encourage everybody to come support the Brockton High School cheerleaders. And I also wanted to thank them publicly for uh, Friday night's game. They had, uh, I believe, three or four of the boxer buddies uh, cheering with them. They, they had a great time. Um, they cheered through almost every single cheer the whole night. Um, it, it was just a really good game, a really good experience. Uh, and the parents were just thrilled. Uh, to have that opportunity. Yeah, that should be a good event. I'm glad you mentioned that. I'm a member of the Enterprise Club, so I, the, they, the club does several of those meat raffles per year to benefit various charities around the city. And uh, it's, it's a lot of fun, and uh, you might win some meat, and the money will help out the cheerleaders. So I'm going to plan on definitely being there. So I'll quick that note with Brockton High football. Um, for folks that didn't see, I hope they get a chance to see that during the Patriots game on Sunday night, there was a film clip from Marciano Stadium during the Boxers game. During Sunday night football, they showed a clip from Friday night's Boxers game. And uh, it was short, but it was, ex it was exciting to see Brockton High football under the Friday night lights, Marciano Stadium featured on a, a national telecast. And, uh, you know, we. Um, there's lots of great things about the high school, but there's no doubt a big part of our history and tradition is high school football at Brockton High. So I was uh, really excited to see it. Alicia. And also on that note, um, this week on WROR, the Brockton High Marching Band was featured. Um, it was kind of interesting to turn on the radio the other day and hear, you know, Brockton boxers to be featured this week. So very proud of that as an old-time marching band yeah. member. <laughs> well, as I, I explained to several people talking about the, the football game being on NBC Sunday night, what's really great, and I guess I've been going there for a long time, but um, what's really great about football games at Brockton High on Friday night is it's about a lot more than the football game. and. I think I did the math before, and on average, there's usually about 300 Brockton High students involved in a Friday night football game in one way or another between marching band, halftime dancers, cheerleaders, um, majorettes, JROTC, students who volunteer in the snack shacks, uh, all of these things. It, it's about 300 Brockton High students that have an active role in a Friday night football game. Um, it's awesome. It's one of my favorite things in the world. And big game this Friday night. Number one Zavarian comes to town. Big game for the boxers. We need everyone out there. All right? Anyone, now, now that I'm done cheerleading, anyone else? All right, I'll entertain a motion. All in favor? This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.